Hi, I'm Suzy Larson. Here's the podcast from Suzy Larson Live. Enjoy the conversation. It's only just a matter of- You're listening to an encore presentation of Suzy Larson Live. It's Welcome, welcome to Suzy Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His very real presence in your life. Well, here we are in Holy Week. And before I introduce my guest today, who's one of your favorites? You've already maybe guessed who it is. I want to read a passage uh, from the Bible, Matthew 27. I'm going to start verse 11. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus replied, you've said it. But when the leading priests and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they're bringing against you? Pilate demanded. But Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Now it was the governor's custom each year during Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year, there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, which one do you want me to release, to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Think about that. Barabbas was a murderer. The religious leaders were jealous of Jesus. Who do you want me to release? Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Leave this innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, which of these two do you want me to release to you? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas. Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder. And so the mob roars today. The mob roared even louder. Crucify him. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he went and sent for a bowl of water, washed his hands before the crowd saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. The people had a choice between releasing a murderer or an innocent man who healed the brokenhearted, bound up their wounds, confronted the world's bullies, stood up to the prideful. They chose death over disruption because Jesus was very disrupting. You know, he disrupted the status quo. He tipped over the tables. He confronted some of the standards that left people in the dust. They chose death. They chose to put him to death. But what they didn't know was that Jesus had his heart set on the cross the whole time because you were the joy set before him. And in verse 35, it says, after they nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. I want you to imagine Jesus hanging on the cross, the the soldiers gambling right below. And so it goes today. Jesus reigns overhead and people gambling with their lives below. Boy, if there's not a day to choose who you'll serve, it is today. Today's the day of salvation. Well, if you listen often enough, every no, you know every month we have our friend Dr. Troy Sproul on the show to talk health and the healing process And we are going to answer your health questions at some point in the show, but we are going to start the conversation today talking about crucifixion. And if you have little ears listening, today's probably at least the first half of the show, first 20 minutes, maybe not the best time, just because we are going to talk a bit about what happened to Jesus even before he went to the cross and what happens to our body when it endures that kind of trauma, what was going on physiologically, emotionally, spiritually for Jesus. And then we will transition Uh, into questions about health and the healing process. But the reason this matters, it's Holy Week. And also, Scripture says very clearly, and on no uncertain terms, by His stripes, you are healed. The judgment that brought us peace was upon Him. That's pretty amazing, don't you think? Well, if you want to get your questions coming in, don't wait. A lot of times people wait till like the last, I don't know, after the bottom of the hour break, and then we get so many we can't cover them. So if you want to, if you're an overachiever, go ahead and text the questions now, 
1-800-273-2484. Quick reminder about today's program. We'll deal with general health questions and just how every step towards healing matters. But for specific medical advice, always seek your, your physician, your doctor's advice. Troy can't diagnose you over the air. You wouldn't want him to do that. And he doesn't want to do that either. So just a, a heads up about that. So let me tell you about my guest. We'll get him on the show. Dr. Troy Sproul is founder and CEO of Synapse Center for Health and Healing, located in Egan, Minnesota. He started Synapse over 26 years ago with a vision to bring an integrative approach to health care through functional medicine, making Synapse an internationally known center for true health. Dr. Troy, welcome back. Thank you for having me. I feel especially privileged to be here this week. I know. I feel the same. Special. Yep. Yep. Before we get into just what Jesus went through, just in your own personal time with God, what's he been talking to you about these days? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get through, uh, uh, what he went through. And I think as we do that, it's just, it just lends itself to more gratitude. And, and as people, uh, go through maybe a difficult time, diff- difficult season and are suffering, it, it will lead to gratitude because of the, the exact same reason with Jesus just sacrificing all that he did for us. Uh, it just helps bring to light, um, just the gift that we've been given and just how how big a deal it is. And when we actually, we'll go through what he actually took on and uh, just point out a few things. I've got a little insight into into just some of the stuff that doesn't make sense uh, that he went through. And that's the, that is the difference between his flesh and, and his God part of who mm-hmm. Jesus was. And it just brings to light just much that much more yeah. that he that he gave us, just how how special and challenging and difficult, like what God did to, to, for us and what he, um, gave us, it just, words can't, can't even do it justice, but just to describe a little bit, because I see how the body heals on, on a daily basis. And I, I see the innate healing that God put in us. And then I realize it started here. This is, yeah. this is where it started for us. And mm-hmm. There's a spiritual healing, of course, uh, that's a part of it, but there's actually a flesh component to this of healing that is because of this sacrifice. And science helps us kind of start to investigate a little bit of the the mystery of that and define it, but all it's doing is proving just how great and awesome God is. Indeed, and you've said you've been on the show, I think, longer than any regular guest Woo-hoo. that I've had. Yeah, you really won the <laughs> award. It's been seven years, I think, that we've had you on every month. And um, you think about... When, when the people were waiting for the Messiah, they were waiting yeah. for a military leader to overthrow Rome, and yet Jesus was born, you know, to a teenage girl in poverty in a trough in a yeah. cave. Like, he kept constantly disrupting the status quo in the mindset. And imagine the disciples walking with him going, is it at the time? Is it time yet? And he kept kind of pushing the boundaries of think bigger, think deeper. And they wanted, you know, to be free of Roman oppression. Jesus wanted to have them be free from the debt of sin, the penalties of sin. But even the idea that by his stripes we'd be healed, that that we have a supernatural connection and access to Jesus because of what he went through. It's just so amazing to me. And so this part might be difficult uh, for some to hear. And I, I, I don't know if you've ever read Rick Renner's um, It's called Sparkling Gems from the Greek. It's a big, thick devotional where he breaks down history, context, Greek uh, context. And he talked about the Roman scourging. And you've probably heard this before, but what they, what the Romans would do, it was just, it was really to make an example. It, it's to really, to get people to a point where they, they don't kill them, they die a slow death. They don't die a quick death, they die a torturous slow death. And they make an example by allowing them to be crucified in front of the townspeople so nobody would dare to act up. But the scourge in itself, I mean, the whip was a short piece of wood with long straps of leather. And at the end of the leather were multiple pieces of broken metal, broken glass, fragmented bone and so you imagine that just this wood handle with these straps with these sharp edges and when they pull that thing back and then they thrust it forward it lodges into the victim's back and the back side their legs everything and they strip them naked in front of everybody just to shame them and then they pull it out and they basically rip flesh from their backside and they do that over and over again to the point where some bleed out They've said, you know, organs have been exposed. The spinal column has been exposed, and it's it's so painful. I mean, I almost didn't want to cover it when I dug in, even though I said we were going to. I almost started to cry because it's so terrifying and terrible. But I'm just wondering, well, let's go back to the garden when he said, Lord, you know, if possible, let this cup pass from me, and he sweated yeah. drops of blood. Talk about just the emotional, spiritual stress he must have been under there. And what was the sweating drops of blood about, just from a scientific perspective? Well, uh, 
number one, it just tells us a little bit about uh, um, where he was at and uh, for him to, to go there knowing what he was about to face. And he knew it full well what yeah. he was walking into. He knew that was his calling. He knew that's the way, that's why he lived his life the way he did. And that's why he was just honoring and being so obedient the whole way. And yet at that moment, we see his, his uh, human side come out and he has concern about, do I really need to do this? Because he knows when you're stripped naked and you're about to go through that, that's vulnerability. Mm -hmm. and Major you, trauma. There's major trauma. And mm -hmm. being that vulnerable just before anything even happens. I don't know if anyone has gone through or if you even have a fear of public speaking. The worst part about public speaking is the time before the actual speaking or the event. And so it's all these things that get brought up into our head and then it creates an actual uh, reaction internally in the body. And we have this physiologic reaction. It's a fight or flight response. And so when it comes to Jesus, normally we see tears. With Jesus, there's blood. Hmm. And so for me, it's as much like that. That's miraculous in its own, in its own way, because when we, for us to be cleansed, it's, it's about pleading the blood of Jesus. It's about his blood. It's just one more thing that shows us uh, about Jesus, about how important the blood of Jesus is. And so when we have these stress responses that are innate, not not crying, but actually innate reactions, that's literally his own nerves sending signals to his glands to secrete uh, fluids. And sometimes people will get scared and they'll mess themselves. And sometimes people will get really sweaty armpits and and uh, things like that. And so these are his glands secreting, but they're... They, they, his body chose to secrete blood wow. versus tears, which wow. I just found find miraculous. Wow. You know, the part, I mean, I didn't mean to come back to this part of the story, but I just have to, even before that, when he's in the grove and they, the soldiers come to find him and they said, you know, which one of you are Jesus? And he says, I am he. And a whole contingent, hundreds of soldiers, just by sheer power of him saying, I am, they fall backward. I mean, yeah. think about that. You know, and I think it was, he was like serving notice to everybody. You're not taking me. I'm yeah. offering my life. But try to imagine a soldier being knocked over by the sheer power of God, brushing yourself off, getting back up as if hundreds of soldiers couldn't keep him if he wasn't willing to go. I mean, it, really, it's worth reading your way through the Gospels, all four Gospels, and just read that story. So now to the, to the flogging. This isn't even the crucifixion yet, but the flogging. Again, so hard, but just hang with us. Um, oh, we got to go to break. I'm sorry. It snuck right up. Where did the time go? We will probably use the first half hour to just talk about what Jesus went through. By his stripes, we are healed. The judgment that brought us peace was upon him. Just imagine that. We just want to honor Christ's sacrifice and just, just get some insight from Dr. Troy on what was going on for him in all of that. You can feel free to send your questions in. If you'd like, you can text them to 877-933-2484. We'll be back in a minute. I'm Susie Larson, host of Susie Larson Live. The religious leaders expected a warrior. The disciples wanted an overthrower. The bullies wanted him to shut up, and the sinners were surprised when he stepped up. At every turn, Jesus surprised them, just as he surprises us now. Why? Because he always has the bigger story in mind, and you are a part of that story. You were the joy set before him. Connecting faith to life, Faith Radio. Thanks for tuning in to Susie Larson Live. So grateful to have you listening today. If you listen often enough, you know we have our good friend Dr. Troy Sproul on the show once a month to talk health and the healing process. And in honor of Holy Week, we wanted to devote a part of the show to talk about what Jesus went through physiologically, emotionally, spiritually. Just think about what he endured and why he sweat drops of blood. As Troy said before the break, he knew full well what was ahead of him. And not only was it just a physical suffering, he bore the weight of the world's sin upon his shoulders. So he felt the weight of the world's sin on top of anguish, emotional trauma and physical trauma. I mean, I think it is good. Angie was saying, our producer during the break, it is good, as painful as it is, to visit this and remember in a, in a sober sort of way what Jesus did for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the Father. And the further rest of the verse says, so let us consider him who endured such scorn from sinful men that we might not grow weary and lose heart. So back to the scourging as he's being whipped with these, you know, fractions of glass and metal and cutting into him. I mean, if you've watched the Passion, Mel Gibson's Passion, uh, 
that's probably the closest thing we've ever seen in a movie to what actually happened. But Scripture says he was marred beyond recognition. But when, whatever you want to speak to about that, Troy, I would love to hear your, just your thoughts of, from a doctor's perspective of what he was enduring. Well, uh, obviously it's pretty um, harsh as far as what he endured, but uh, when you when you look at the lashings, like it's not just one lashing, and like you said, marred beyond recognition, it, it's multiple lashings. And any time you get trauma to uh, the tissue like that, you're going to get, there's, a, there's an innate cellular danger response that happens. So let me just kind of go through what we know today that happens with that. Inside the cell, if you have any type of danger response from a trauma like that, the powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria, literally start to send signals that it's kind of like a toxin. They just kind of let these toxins go out. The toxin actually stiffens the cell itself so that nutrients, oxygen stuff can't get into the cell. Mm. It shuts down your, your thyroid. So your thyroid hormone can't get into the cell to shut down the metabolism so everything can focus on the injury that just occurred. So if you're talking about one puncture wound or something like that, the body then starts to to clot the area and starts to send all of its attention there. The way it gets the brain's attention are pain receptors. So you'll get a pain receptor. Now, if you're talking about one puncture wound, like stepping on a nail or something like that, everything focuses to that area. But when you're talking about a scourging, that's over the entire body. And so you've got all of these signals going back to the brain At the same time, you have all of these cells that are causing uh, a shutdown mechanism like globally around the body. So the fact that he goes through this and then is able to to even walk and move from one spot to the next is just miraculous in its own right. Because you're now asking your brain to send signals to muscles that the inside of of the muscle is literally shutting it down saying, don't do this. Don't do this. And he's doing it. And he's doing it. Wow. And so you're going against that that, that component. And so you're supposed to stay there and heal, basically, if that's what the body, how it was made. So he was forced to to move, and he did. And and even, I know we haven't gotten there, but when he's on the cross, he refuses to to be numbed of the pain. Right. Which is, for me, even more, like, I'm going to start crying now. Yeah, I know. Because it means he had to feel the pain. He, he, for us, he had to feel it, desperately feel it. Yeah. And that's crucial. He, he knew he had to go through that. He had to experience it. He couldn't numb it. He had to take it all on, and he did. Mm-hmm. And so that is just an intense amount of pain that he took all at once. And yeah. it's, it's just, for me, it's overwhelming to think of yeah. that, that, you could, uh, that anyone can even experience that and go through that. Yeah, I feel the same way. And, um, you know, I read that the crossbeam typically weighed about 100 pounds. So you think about, you said his body, you know, in, in some, in many cases I read in these Roman scourgings, because of the loss of blood, they would have cardiac arrest. They would yeah. bleed out. I mean, the, the trauma to their body was just things were shutting down. And so then to step up under, so his body's screaming, don't move, yeah. you know, but he has to move. He still has to go to the cross. He's carrying this cross beam 100 pounds. At some point, he gets physically so weak. Simon of Cyrene steps in. But then, as you say, he goes to the cross, which in and of itself, it's another whole torture after he's been yeah. battered. And the way they position his feet in his, and the, the nail doesn't go in his hands. It goes in the wrists, between the bones of the feet. And they position them. And, and I read that sometimes Romans, just for fun, because they got so bored with all their crucifixions, they would position their victims in different ways just to be funny, but um, but he, to have his knees bent and to push up so he could catch the breath. But they said every time he'd drop down, like their arms would pull out a socket. And do, yeah. I mean, it was it's really the worst way to die. Yeah, and the other thing that is um, miraculous with that is, I think, first of all, just, just him again, taking carrying the cross and just moving from point A to point B. That's like trying to drive your car with the emergency brake on. Mm. And so you've got one part of your brain saying stop, 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 and the other one saying go, go, go. So from a physiological perspective, it's very, very challenging. But I know people have experienced this. Think about if your blood pressure drops too low, what happens? We get mentally confused. We don't have the energy. We faint. We pass out. And so as he's when he's scourged, there's a lot of blood loss there. And we know that he he basically was bled dry uh, on the cross. And one of the most miraculous things for me is to think about when I really think about um, what happened. And, and really, I didn't go into the depths until we talked about maybe 
thinking about the physiology of what happened. I never thought about this until you brought this to my attention. But for me, it's quite miraculous that he made it all that way without passing out. And then as the brain and the cells stop getting oxygen, because when you lose that much blood, you basically um, don't have any oxygen to the brain or the cells. So he lost all this blood. And I'm just going to read Luke 23, yeah. uh, 46. And when Jesus had cried out, cried out at with a loud voice, that's, that's energy. Loud voice wow. doesn't happen. You're, wow. you're a weak person can't cry out with a loud voice. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. For, for me, the human side and our flesh, there is nothing left there. That was his spirit. That was the God part of Jesus declaring it at the end because that is miraculous. Our blood pressure, when it drops that much, can't have that happen. The fact that he didn't pass out like that and was able to even speak that with authority is miraculous. Mm. And you read those words, you don't necessarily think, uh, you know, you think about a lot of stuff, but to think that he was even capable of saying that. And having the clarity of thought yes. to make such a, de- and even to say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. Yes. Right? Yeah. And that's why I think, you know, that that in Matthew 28, where it talks about he hung on the cross above and they gambled with his clothes below. That jumped off the page at me years ago. And I thought, this is even so today. I mean, he's not on the cross anymore, but he is sovereign overall while people gamble with their lives below. But when he died, the earth trembled. The earth responded. The mm-hmm. earth darkened and it trembled. And imagine the veil being torn in two. So miles away, wherever the temple was, the priest was in there ready to make uh, the sacrifice of the, the, you know, the spotless lamb. And he didn't get a chance to do that because the veil was literally torn in two and the place shook. Try to imagine all these religious leaders who were jealous and they knew they were jealous. That's what it was. They were finding fault with him because there there was an anointing and a power and a love and an authority. And he was someone they couldn't intimidate. So they were jealous. And to have the earth respond to his death and to have the temple torn into and imagine the trauma even of the disciples. You know, I mean, as we get ready to go to break, I'm going to see if I can read this. I think I got a minute, don't I? All right. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried, our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All we like sheep, every one of us, have gone astray. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. If you've never trusted Jesus for salvation, do it today. What a perfect time to trust. We're all sinners. We need a Savior. And thank God we have one. Jesus, thank you for coming to earth. We'll be back with more with Dr. Troy in just a moment. Hope you're having a beautiful day. Thanks so much for tuning in to Susie Larson Live. Dr. Troy Sproul is my guest today. He joins me every month for health and the healing process. He's CEO and founder of Synapse Center for Health and Healing, located in Egan, Minnesota. I know we've got listeners from all over the world, but uh, you need, do need to know he does virtual visits, right? Do you still do virtual visits sometimes? Sorry. Yes, we yeah, do. Kind yeah. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. No. Synapse. It's, it's official synapse.com or? Uh, he doesn't yes, know. Yes, I don't. <laughs> I, I think it is official yeah. staff stuff. Something uh, like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Google. Okay. So I need to go back to the text line so I can see it. It just, dis- there we go. Here's a uh, listener said this. This is so moving and fascinating. Dr. Troy mentioned mitochondria. Does the cell respond the same in emotional trauma as in physical trauma? Also, can you give us a brief list of the best things we can do to support the health of our mitochondria? Really great question. So let's take the first one first. Does the cell respond the same in emotional trauma as in physical trauma? What do you say? Well, first of all, I want to say this is why I love doing this show because I get to talk about Jesus and mitochondria at the literally same time. at the same time. Yes. My world is awesome. I just mm-hmm. want to say that. Mm-hmm. So I love this question. Mitochondria um, is, uh, uh, we've learned in school, if you Taking any science, they talk about being the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, but it does more than that. It measures your uh, – it's like a sensor as well for energy, input and output. So it's kind of like if a, 
you open up a fridge door, the coolant will kick on and uh, start to regulate it. And if you close it, it'll kick off. Well, our mitochondria does the same thing. And then it also helps with our cellular defense mechanism, which is what I was uh, describing uh, with the scourge. And so when it comes to emotional trauma, it can 100% definitively affect the mitochondria, not as aggressively as a, as a trauma like a, a physical injury. But what happens with emotional trauma is we know that our cells will really fold up. Just like a frightened child, the cell will fold up. And the cell has receptors on the outside. So if the receptors get covered when it folds, you can't get uh, the nutrients into the cells efficiently. And most importantly, you can't get your thyroid hormone into that cell. So if the cell membrane becomes stiffened from internal stress or an external stress, like mental stress, then the thyroid hormone can't get can't bind to it. It can't get into the cell. Then the thyroid hormone has to like bind to the outside of the nucleus and then bind to the mitochondria. The reason why that's important is the thyroid hormone is the key to start it all. Mm. If you don't have a key in the ignition, you can't start the engine, which is what the mitochondria is. So emotional trauma... Um, basically, if you have a little bit of emotional trauma, you get a little bit of stiffening of the cell. If you have a large emotional trauma, you get a large stiffening of the cell. So in a real gut-wrenching, emotionally traumatic event, um, uh, definitely you can have a a shutdown of mitochondria. And we know that you have to, let me say it this way, in in our mindset class that uh, we do these uh, classes within our programs, we have one of our slides focuses on the beginning of all healing and beginning of all healing starts with forgiveness. So it doesn't matter what people come in for headaches or fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue. We talk about forgiveness, the need for forgiveness, because if you don't forgive, then you are recreating trauma, emotional trauma to your own cells on a daily basis. And creating a physiological response Absolutely. repeatedly, continually. You know, my book, Fully Alive, it's about what happens in our soul happens in our cells. And, and this is one of the reasons we do this show with you every month is because you both, we both have this passion. I want you to picture, friend, if you've got all this emotional trauma in your story and then your cells, it's your body's responding at a cellular level, which it totally is. You can't compartmentalize trauma. Then imagine layers of healing coming as you go about it and trust God, that cell opening up yes. like a flower and receiving exactly. your nutrients, receiving your hydration. I mean, this is the vision and passion that we have for you is to get a vision that for healing that would impact you on a cellular level. That's how fearfully and wonderfully made we are. Absolutely. And we, even in science, they have shown that when people are in a state of fear, their cells close up. When they're in a state of love, their cells open up. So Uh, Healing starts with forgiveness and then uh, just experiencing Jesus. You can have instantly physiological change in the entire body by experiencing the love of Jesus. Wow. And exactly what we talked about right now, just the gratitude you have for what he did for us, uh, that's, that's the beginning part. Really receiving that is there's a healing that comes with that as well. And so... Um, the second part of her her question was talking about what can we do for our mitochondria. That's number that's number one. So I, I really get healed. Get get healed mm-hmm. by by receiving the mm-hmm. love of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Like really dive into what does that look like for you. Uh, also, I'm going to go through some of the um, um, more daily things that we run into. Uh, the mitochondria basically it's about the internal and external environment around the cells. So you want to make sure that your thyroid's working. That's that's your metabolism. That's number one. So many things in our world right now actually shut that down. Uh, Chemicals that mimic estrogen will deplete your thyroid hormone. Iodine deficiency by not taking things from the sea will will, uh, cause problems. And then different things, deficiencies can set up a lack of thyroid hormone. But even things like uh, intracellular infections, parasites, viruses, or a change in pH, or the most common one by far is inflammation. Low-grade inflammation will block thyroid more than anything else. Mm right now and that comes from sugar and diet and lifestyle not sleeping things of that nature so it's really the foundational stuff eat right think right sleep right uh, move right exercise right and then feed your body to nourish your cells and your soul and that's the foundational stuff most of us are inflamed acidic and toxic Mm, with our thoughts and our body so it's really that foundational stuff will help with the mitochondria and you'll see things like antioxidants like coq10 and stuff like that you need First of all, the thyroid, and then you need oxygen and a sugar molecule. One oxygen molecule and one sugar molecule will make 37 ATP. That's the ATP is like the fuel. That's, the, that's what turns, turns the cell on and starts the energy process. And so we need balanced blood sugar. 
when you have diabetes or insulin resistance, then you're not sending that sugar to the mitochondria properly. If you have a candida, fungal, bacterial, or um, parasite infection, they feed off of sugar. So that's where it becomes problematic. So guess what really is super beneficial for the mitochondria when you have an infection that's eating the sugar that you're consuming? Mm. Fasting. Wow. It induces a process called autophagy. And autophagy literally means cell eating, and it will start to clean up the inside of the cell and feed the mitochondria. So I, I tell people, get into prayer and fasting. That works for you. And sometimes people are so toxic in such a bad state that, that there's a process there. And we bring them through that in some of our programs for the, for the people that can tolerate it. Some people are actually in such a spot they can't tolerate the fasting yet. Like they're like the, the detox process that it initiates their body can't, isn't ready for. Yeah, it's too intense yeah. and, the, and their blood sugar drops too low, which mm. again, think about what Jesus went through. Yeah. And if we can't tolerate a 12 or 24 hour fast because our blood sugar drops too much and Jesus lost all of his blood and sugar in the matter of just a couple hours for us and yet was still able to say what he said and still able to to be loose enough to deny some level of pain relief, uh, uh, even more miraculous. Wow, absolutely amazing. Well, okay, thank you for that. All right, this one says, try not to be too descriptive. 59 with a history of diverticulitis, had surgery five years ago, now struggling with food, flying out of, out, right out through me, she says, he or she, I'm not sure, stopped coffee, and that has helped, but what else can I do? I dream of getting on a plane and coming to see you. Well, you keep dreaming and keep praying because anything's possible. Lots of people hop on a plane to come see the doc. So, but what do you say, doc? Yeah, look look for inflammatory foods. So, coffee is a stimulant and an inflammatory food. Sugar is inflammatory. Dairy is the next most common one. And so, you have to reestablish the lining of the digestive system. It's highly likely that there's a SIBO scenario going on there. So, a low FODMAP diet is a good place to start and start to reestablish the good bacteria. Uh, gluten, dairy are two of the most common, and when we see diverticulitis, they're they're like pockets. So we, uh, it means it's outpouching of the actual bowel itself and intestines, and that is a muscle. The intestines are a muscle, so we want to reduce our stress, improve our sleep, because you've got to get out of fight or flight and into rest and digest. If a nerve stops sending a signal to a muscle, it atrophies, and so it slowly shrinks. If the main nerve in our brain, called the vagus nerve, stops stimulating the digestive system, it shrinks. It, it becomes weaker. It stretches. So it's important to get out of that fight or flight uh, and uh, look at what stressors might be there. Most people have a hidden sleep disorder. So just assessing and addressing sleep. But to start with just pulling other inflammatory foods out and see what works for you. And, and there's these um, cells, uh, the end, tips of the cells, where they have what's called microvilli. They're like little branches of a tree, but when you have this problem, they can like lay down flat, like like when a, a windstorm has gone through a field. And we need those branches upright so that they can absorb all the food that you're eating. So again, um, making sure you're sticking to a avoiding the foods you're reactive to. Wheat, dairy, or I should say gluten, dairy, and sugar, uh, and coffee are the big ones. Then after that, it could be corn, um, uh, tomato sauce is another weird one, but uh, avoiding some of these foods and letting your your gut heal and repair while you're working on the rest and digest part of of the healing process. And if, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember right, stimulating the vagus nerve, there are some creative ways you can do that. Singing, yes. actually. Singing, yep. yep. Uh-huh. That's right. And also, if you're on an exercise ball and you're on your back, almost in an arch where you bring your arms back, yes. that instantly puts you into rest digest because yes. you can't be in fight flight in that position just right? get into that extension position yep. that's right and so it helps with relaxation think of when someone's yawning and they stretch back that's actually triggering the vagal nerve to help your digestive response so yeah just anybody listening today because we're so we bend towards fight flight throughout the day sing you know, yep. If you stop singing, maybe start singing again. You also mentioned SIBO, S-I-B-O, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and you said the low FODMAP diet. Just this might help you, but there's an IBS app, an irritable bowel syndrome app that you can download for free. That You have to do some searching, but the, the one that I'd found years ago when I had SIBO also had low FODMAP yeah. suggestions, and it just made it easier. So you could pull that thing up if you're out to eat, and yep. it's, it's high, low, whatever, and you follow it, and it'll help you heal. So Absolutely. maybe that'll help. Okay. All right. 65-year-old man with back issues, pain in thoracic area, numbness in arms, MRI found congenital short pedicle canal 
disc bulges and degeneration, uh, ulcinate spurring and severe form stenosis. I'm so sorry. Want to find root cause and heal naturally. Any ideas? Well, when you have foraminal stenosis and you have that level of dysfunction, um, root cause is almost always an internal referral. That can be physical. So that's a physical condition. Uh, so chiropractors... Who so are like reversed, a structural, you yeah, mean? Yeah, that's a structural component. Yeah. And so foraminal stenosis means that the the, the uh, area that the nerve roots come out of is started to overgrow or basically started to become compressing to the nerve. So there there is some things you can still do about that. And uh, sometimes chiropractic helps. Sometimes it's already too late and you do need surgeries. Um, but most times if you can get in with a good chiropractor to get the alignment part, a good physical therapist, to get the structural components of addressing the muscle stuff. Addressing what set it up is either like a postural thing. If this person was over a computer for 25 years and, and hunched forward, that can set it off. If you're looking for a root cause source, usually that's coming from an upper GI problem for that area in particular. So it could be a liver, a stomach um, issue, a pancreas issue, or part of the GI tract that's referring directly to that area. And so those are the most common ones that we see. There are a bunch of other things that are um, potential, but hard to actually know root cause without doing a full assessment. But there is basically uh, a referral. So the way I usually explain it is people can have what's called a viscerosomatic reflex. It's kind of like when someone has a heart attack, the pain goes down the left arm. I can treat the left arm all I want. The real problem is the heart. In the mid-back, there's only a few things that can set off and refer to the muscles of the low back. In order to get degenerative changes like they've got, they've had to have less support nutritionally and blood Mm. flow going to that area. Interesting. Because the muscles got too tight or the blood vessels weren't able to deliver the restorative nutrients. That happens from either chronically in in a position they shouldn't be in, something that got injured that never got fixed correctly, or a referral from one of their upper organs. Interesting. As we go to break, it makes me want to just mention something Doc has talked about many times before, just because so many, most people hunch forward. Most people are in that front forward flexed. And you said, you know, the back the back side of the body is what stimulates a part of the brain that's really yeah. important. So he talks about wall angels all the time, where in the morning, look at he's jumping up and down. He's so happy about the wall angels right now. But I wish we could do a video, but picture yourself against the back a wall. And actually, don't you like, you push your back because we tend to arch. Everything so you goes push, back against so the wall, So you get as yes. flat as you can up against against the back of uh, the wall and then like a snow angel you're making kind of goal posts with your arms yeah. right and yep. then you just you reach up but you try to keep all of it aligned with the wall you'll you'll feel yourself engaging muscles but that would be a good thing to do even a couple times a day if you're absolutely. especially hovering over the computer yes absolutely yeah. I get an A. He's so happy. I mentioned that. I love wall angels. (laughs) Wall angels are our friend. All right. When we come back, we'll answer more questions. You can text them in 877-933-2484. We'll be back in a minute. Hi, I'm Susie Larson, host of Susie Larson Live. I remember one day after my show, driving home from the station, when my heart was very heavy. I was burdened with something that I really couldn't talk about, but God knew about. I was crying out to him for wisdom, insight, direction, something. Give me something, God, I cried. Suddenly my ears perked to the voice on my radio, and it was someone on Faith Radio talking about the very problem that I had. I work for Faith Radio, yet at that moment I was a recipient of a divine connection of hearing the right word at the right time. That's what God does. We love him for it. Every day we do our best to serve up the best leaders, the best voices of our day to help disciple you in your faith. But then God does what only he can do. He steps in and helps you to hear the right word at the right time. If Faith Radio has become a part of your daily journey with God, we would love to hear your story. Share how God is using Faith Radio to encourage you and to help you grow at myfaithradio.com. Thanks for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live, having a really great conversation today with Dr. Troy Spurl. He's CEO and founder of Synapse Center for Health and Healing. And we found the website. It doesn't matter that Troy's in the office. Angie Googled it and we found it. Officialsynapse.com is the website. Officialsynapse.com. I don't blame you because I'd be the same way. I don't know. It's out there somewhere. So, All right. We've got a few more questions and a little bit more time to answer them. This dear listener says that they've had an enlarged thyroid since age 19, recently diagnosed with Hashimoto's. Motos, anything they can do to reduce swelling of their thyroid. And she wants, I think it's a she, wants to come see you as well. What do you say? Yeah, so uh, 
there's really two different types of thyroid disorders, peripheral thyroid disease and hypothyroid, which pre um, comes before the actual thyroid disorder. If you've got Hashimoto's, you've already got damage to the thyroid. Mm. And so there is something causing that. And so it's an inflammatory reaction. Uh, and so identifying what set that up is really important. So that could be anything uh, from a tooth or dental uh, problem to a hormone issue to just an inflammatory scenario. So to stop it, you have to really look at it. It's a full, it's a bit, a bit of a process, but you have to look at uh, improving your immune system reaction. So it's an appropriate reaction. Your immune system does two things other than clean up the body. It, it controls and manages your inflammation and it fights off infection. And so uh, a, an infection somewhere could be identified. It can also be uh, a problem with environmental chemicals or something that has an affinity for the thyroid tissue. Usually these, these are plastics um, that mimic estrogen. So estrogen replacement therapy can also do that. So a lot of young uh, women, if it, if this is a female, get put on um, estrogen pills very young and that can damage the thyroid in some cases because the the there's a seat on this, uh, this globulin that, that transport thyroid to your cells and estrogen can actually sit in that seat. And so when you see that uh, happening, the iodine gets displaced and then it'll go and stimulate, the thyroid hormone, I should say, gets displaced and it stimulates the closest cell, which is the thyroid. So people will develop goiters um, because that thyroid is being uh, stimulated. So they, it actually enlarges and swells. Mm. So there's a lot of different variables and factors there. Always start with uh, making sure the gut is good. So what leaky gut goes with autoimmune. We just don't know if it's an autoimmune primary or something set that off. So again, stress can cause leaky gut. Uh, physical trauma uh, where you have a concussion can cause leaky gut. Hormone and chemical imbalances can cause leaky gut. Infections, dysbiosis can cause leaky gut. So there is a lot that can be done. There's some great books out there on Hashimoto's. Dr. Isabella Wentz has some good ones that really give you the basics. Um, my new favorite book that uh, I read was on a vacation is called The Thyroid Debacle. And um, I agree with the, the majority of what's written in that book. It's uh, by a functional medicine chiropractor and, and uh, MD who herself went through thyroid stuff and realized how backwards thyroid problems are being treated. Wow. So a lot lot to unpack there and mm. uh, a lot to actually work on to help prevent. But it's You're good. the basics of balanced vitamin D, um, omega-3 and glutathione are some of the key things along with the diet and stuff to, to get good. the ball rolling. Okay, I, I want to take a crack at this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dr. Susie. And then, and then we'll let you speak to it okay. and give them the real answer. This one said their son who's 19, has nut allergies, has started to get an itchy head when he eats spicy food. I'm just guessing. Is that a histamine reaction? That's a histamine reaction. Okay. You take it from there, Doc. That's all I know. Uh, that's all I have, too. So <laughs> that's... That is, uh, yeah. so it developed, you said, at 19? Uh, ni- 19 years old and has nut allergies, but started to get an itchy head oh. when he eats spicy food. And has nut allergies. Okay, so okay. so there are, yeah, there could be other factors there, but that is an itchy head can be a couple different things. So it's probably histamine, it could be candida or yeast. Either way, it's an immune system reaction. And um, there is an, there's a balance that can needs to happen there. So histamine is being most likely is the culprit. So we'll talk about that. And there has to be a balance. There's a lot of things that affect histamine. So again, um, developing allergies to other things like dust mites or or pets. Or so you look at what was new that was brought into the environment. And a lot of times, when things aren't detoxified through the kidneys or the liver, then it'll back up into the lymph and then out through the skin. Hmm. So that you have to make sure that things are actually f- detoxifying properly. Would something like NAC help him? Um, Yes. I mean, good, a little would bit it be... with the glutathione, yeah. So, okay. So the NAC is a precursor for the glutathione for the liver part of it, but there's an enzyme called DAO that the kidney uses to pull histamines out, and that has, uh, that's copper sensitive, so mm-hmm. you have to have enough copper uh, in you. And part of it, though, the first thing I always look at, though, is the lymph able to, to flow out? So uh, if, if the head, if there's a recent sinus infection or one even from months ago, or something going on with the the head where you can't drain properly, that's always the first thing I look at because itchy head and it's coming out through the skin, we have to make sure, well, is the exit strategy working there? So can the the glymph system drain properly out of the head? So people who have 
swollen sinuses or the drainage passages may not be all that all that uh, open. So we look at that first. And so cranial work can be done. Sometimes you do have to have surgery, but that's usually late stage and only for developmental problems. So once that's been established that, yes, things can drain and move freely, then you start looking at the things, how do I support and the go liver after and the kidney, the liver and kidney and yeah. go after what's triggering it. So try and identify it, what it is that you're reacting to, then pull it out while you then go after the mechanism of dysfunction as far as the ability for your immune system to properly remove it. And there's a lot of things that will throw our immune system off when it comes to um, reacting to uh, the world. So we, we either are fighting infection or or basically creating an allergy response, and it's called a Th1, Th2, or T helper cell response in the body. You want to get that into balance, and some people just get significantly out of balance with that. A quick question, because I have a couple more coming in, but so would would taking something like cortisone be treating symptoms? Like, because you want them to get to the root cause of this, and this would just more support, give some relief for symptoms, but you want to really get to the bottom of why. Yeah, so that's a great, so that tells me you've been studying, that's good. <laughs> so quercetin helps with the histamine response, so it may actually help bring it back into balance. So it's not just a Band-Aid, it can help bring it back okay. into balance. Now, if you have to take it for the rest of your life, different story. Okay. That means you're missing something. something. Okay. But if you take it for uh, intermittently or even for three to six months and then you don't need it, Game changer. You've you've overcome what the, the, the problem is. Great. Thank you for yeah. that. Skeletal muscle. Yes. This dear person wants to know what it is and why it matters. So uh, skeletal muscle, there, there's a couple different types of muscle in our body. There's smooth muscle that uh, helps with like our bowels. There's cardiac muscle, which is the pumping of our blood and our vascular system. And then there's skeletal muscle. It's striated, so it, it looks different under a microscope. And it has... Uh, um, just these these beautiful nerves in the middle of them called Golgi tendon organs and or at the end is Golgi tendon organs and then muscle spindles in the middle of them and these this contraction and relaxation of the muscles will stimulate these nerves to fire to our brain specifically eventually up to the cerebellum which then goes to our cortex the reason why that's important is because if you don't have that firing of the brain our brain atrophies it's our skeletal muscle hmm. that keeps our brain active more wow. than anything so, for example, when an astronaut goes to space, they can only stay in space for a short period of time, two years, because they start to develop dementia or cognitive disorders. Wow. Because there's no gravity in space. So you don't need to use your skeletal muscle. Use it or lose it. Yep. And mm-hmm. so you'll see back in the 70s and the early 80s, they had everyone on those exercise bikes. Remember those Tang commercials? You remember those? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, basically, uh, that's they tried to exercise, but there's no gravity. So it was like, it's like, when you're in wasn't weight bearing. There wasn't weight bearing, so mm-hmm. it doesn't actually get that contraction because you don't need it. So a lot of that contraction is based on calcium and um, the myotomes of the of the muscle. In order to build muscle, you have to break it down, and then it builds back up. But people need to remember when our cells break down, and our red blood cells will break down every 126 days. So we are, our cells are being replaced all the time. So think of it this way. All of our cells have cells, cell walls. So just like the room that you're in, they're made with two-by-fours. And so your body will make new muscle out of whatever raw material it has. The raw material that it has is the food that you've been eating in the previous week, the previous month, and up to the last seven years. So if you eat trans fatty acids or trans or bad oils, trans literally means bent. That's like building walls with bent two-by-fours. And it collapses. Wow. This is why diet and exercise matter. Wow. We got to go. And I see more questions that have come in. It went so fast. Dr. Troy, thank you. Thank you for the time. And if you want to check out the clinic, officialsynapse.com, officialsynapse.com. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. I always pleasure. appreciate you. We yep. appreciate and love you so much. I pray you found some encouragement here today. We're going to grab those questions and save them for next time Troy is on. God bless you. We love you. And we'll meet you back here next time. Thanks for listening to this conversation from Susie Larson Live. These podcasts are available because of your support. You can become a supporter now at MyFaithRadio.com. And thanks for sharing this audio link to spread the good news of the gospel and to grow the impact of the show. Also, 
If you would, take a moment to subscribe to the podcast today at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player and never miss a show again.